Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and today we're gonna to talk about apple juice, I mean brake fluid. Um, this is an important part of your car's braking system, and it's one that's often neglected. And there's a lot of things to know about brake fluid, so being the sort of nerd I am, I'm gonna talk about all the exciting and interesting things there are to know about brake fluid. As always, if you're watching this live, please put any questions or comments, or questions in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. I work best when I'm working off, off questions. Uh, if you are watching this in the future, put the questions in the comments. We will do our best to, uh, to answer them, although obviously not in real time. So, brake fluid. It's got a tough job. It is basically, it has to be a non-compressible fluid that can accept extremely high heat, but also cannot freeze. Um, because this is the connection between your foot and your brake pads. This is what actually transmits all of that force from your, from, that you're exerting on the brake pedal through various things to amplify it to the pads that squeeze the car and slow the car down and everything. Um, and uh, it, it sees extremely high heat, especially if you're using the car on the track. All of that energy that you're, that you're absorbing in the brake system, or that you're basically you're trying to get rid of, is turned into kinetic energy, it's turned into heat, some of that heat goes into the rotors to get dissipated in the atmosphere, some of it goes into the pads, and some of it works its way into the fluid as well. So that's why um, temperature ratings are so very important. Now, the temperature ratings that are given on these things, and I have a, a selection of brake fluids here, is the boiling point. And that's the point, obviously, where the brake fluid boils. We all understand how that works. And when brake fluid boils, your pedal goes long. What happens is you all of a sudden, instead of having a non-compressible fluid, you have a compressible gas in your brake lines, and you have to compress that gas before you can get any work done at the caliper. Um, so boiled brake fluid means all of a sudden your pedal goes long. Hopefully you still make the corner, your heart rate goes up. Um, if you don't make the corner, well, your heart rate probably goes up anyway. But uh, the bad part is even if you let it cool, the brake pedal will come back some, but it's probably left bubbles in the system which means you'll always have that spongy, that long pedal. So that's one of the reasons why we have to make sure we have a good enough specification for how we're gonna be using our car. But there's a little fun side effect too, another little factor, in that this stuff is hygroscopic, which means it absorbs water. Now that seems like a bad thing, but it's not completely. And the reason is because water is going to get into your brake system no matter what. It's gonna seep in past the, the plastic, um, Reservoir plus all the seals. That's just the nature of, of life. Water's gonna get in there. And if the brake fluid doesn't absorb it, the water stays separate. And then it sits at the low points in the system. It rusts out your lines from the inside. And in more exciting situations, it can freeze. Um, which you can imagine, not a desirable scenario. So the brake fluid actually does you a favor by absorbing that into the fluid itself. It doesn't leave you with pockets of water throughout your brake system. The downside is that water, of course, has a boiling temperature of 212 degrees at uh, standard temperatures or standard pressure, so that drops the boiling point in your brake fluid. So that's why when you are looking at the specifications on a brake fluid, <laughs> maybe not in this one, um, let's grab this one. This is the StopTech STR600, which is a really good DOT4 brake fluid. And Travis, I don't know if you can get in close enough, but you can see it actually says on the back here what the dry and wet boiling points are there. In this case, it goes from 594 degrees to 404 degrees um, as its typical wet and dry boiling points. Now that wet boiling point is with a total of 3.7% water. Not a whole lot of water. We're not talking about diluting this stuff down quite a bit. So it doesn't take much water to really drop the boiling temperature of your brake fluid down. And so all of a sudden you think you've got 600 degree temperature or 600 degree brake fluid, you don't. You've got 400 degree brake fluid. That's a pretty significant difference. Do you have a question there, Travis? Um, yes, but you're probably gonna get to it. Okay, there is a question. Yeah. I will probably get to it. If not, uh, remind me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm gonna go through the specifications. Of course, you've all seen, you've, you've certainly seen that there are different types of, different specifications of brake fluid. We have a DOT3 here. This is generic, you know, this is equivalent of a black and round all season tire in terms of brake fluid. That's DOT3, and these are all DOT4 fluids. Um, it should say on the DOT4, they all say DOT4 on the front of them somewhere, except for this one, this is a 5.1. So these are all DOT specifications. Um, a DOT3 fluid has to have a wet boiling point of no less than 284 degrees Fahrenheit and a hot boiling point, or dry boiling point, sorry, of 401. 
So basically, when it's fresh, it's good for about 400 degrees. Um, when it's old and crusty, it's good for about 284. That's, and again, that's that 3.7%. Um, DOT4 is very similar in formulation. It has a couple of different extra chemicals tossed in there. Uh, and that has a, a dry boiling point of 446 and a wet of 311. So basically, it can handle, that specification can handle higher temperatures, both wet and dry. Um, so most, most racing brake fluids you see are going to be a DOT4. DOT5, which is the one that's missing here, we'll get to in a moment. Um, DOT5.1 is super high. It is 500 and 356. Now you notice that that's, those are again minimum numbers in order to meet that specification. Um, and it is, it's, its composition is very similar to a DOT4 in terms of what's inside there. Now again, it's important to note that these are minimums. Um, you know, a DOT4 has a minimum dry temperature or dry boiling point of 446 degrees, but I mean, we have one here that's for 600, we have one here that's for 600. Um, yeah, these, these are all 600. So obviously, when you're running a race vehicle, when you're running your, car, your Miata on track and you're really working the brakes hard, you're gonna be going for one of these. The trick is, is that these fall off faster as they start to absorb water. So a DOT4 with a little bit of moisture absorption will start to fall off, it will start to, its, its boiling point will drop faster than a DOT3. And that's why if you are running your car on the track hard, you're running an exotic brake fluid, you need to keep it fresher because it basically will go stale faster. That's effectively what it's doing when it's absorbing the water, it's just going stale. Um, there's also viscosity as part of that specification in terms of how thick the fluid is. Um, the DOT 5.1 stuff is quite, uh, low viscosity compared to the others. Uh, one thing you can get into trouble with the really high temperature stuff is their viscosity gets fairly high, which can cause problems with ABS systems. Um, but if you read on the back, it will tell you if it's compatible with ABS, basically if the manufacturer thinks that it is ABS compatible. And all of these are. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, how often should I change brake fluid? If you're just driving around the street just a normal little Sunday afternoon streetcar, you should probably change your brake fluid every year. Um, the, the fluid does change color as it ages. It gets darker and darker. Uh, different fluids are different colors to start off with, but they tend to be a fairly light color. Everything from clear, some of the, the Valvoline stuff, it looks like water, um, to apple juice. If it start, as it gets older, it starts getting darker and it will start looking more like apple cider. Not so good. Um, so once a year is a safe way to do it. If you put your car away for the winter, change the fluid in the spring, um, for example, it would be a great way to do it because then you've got fresh fluid that hasn't been sitting there absorbing water through the entire winter. Um, if you're running on track, you're gonna wanna do it more often than that, partly because you're gonna want as close to the dry boiling point as possible, but also because all the fluid that's in your calipers has been subjected to extremely high, the highest temperatures in the system. Um, and that can break down the fluid somewhat. So. If you're running racing um, and you're working your brakes hard, you may be doing a little bit of a flush after every, um, every session. I mean, honestly, I do that with my V8 car on the track. At certain tracks, which are very, very hard in the brakes, I will do a quick, not a full-on flush, but I will just basically change the fluid in the calipers probably once per session, simply because it's working it so hard. Um, now, the reason that we talk about doing it by time instead of by mileage, you know, you have a, if you have a garage queen that never really goes out anywhere, it's still absorbing that moisture through the air. It's not from the act of driving, it's just simply from the act of existing in our climate. Um, so you might be able to get it with two years. Uh, manufacturers like Honda and Volkswagen, those kind of guys, they are all over the map in terms of how often, but two years is usually about the maximum. And we're a performance Miata shop, so we're gonna say every year is a good idea, especially if you're using a more exotic fluid. If you're using the black and round stuff, um, you can probably stretch it for two years because this is the sort of thing I use in my 66 Cadillac. It doesn't really put much load on the brakes because all it does is cruise around town and make big burbly noises. So I'm not pushing the brakes too hard. The V8 Miata, that's the sort of stuff that gets this fresh constantly on the drip. Uh, questions, Travis? So what fluid and pad combination would we recommend for a daily car that might see autocross but no truck? <laughs> okay, so the question is what fluid and pad combination would we recommend for a, a daily driver slash autocross car that doesn't see track use? And this is where these videos can go down the rabbit hole for your specific use. Now, pad choice and brake fluid choice are different. Brake fluid, you're always worried about that maximum capacity. There's no such thing as having a brake fluid that is over-specified. Um, you know, running, running fresh 600 uh, on a streetcar is not gonna hurt anything. 
um, running full on race pads on a streetcar, not so good because the pads will never be in their operating range. Um, so I would select both of those separately. And they act differently when they overheat. If you're ever on track and, you, and you're having overheat or brake problems, if the brake feels like someone's, the pedal's nice and firm, but so, feels like someone has replaced your pads with wooden blocks, you're pressing on the pedal, it feels good, but nothing's happening, that's overheated pads. If, you're, uh, if your pedal goes long, you know, you go to hit the pedal and just goes to the floor, that's overheated fluid. That's an important thing to distinguish. But I would consider those two uh, choices to be separate. Um, we do have a number of brake pad options available in the Flymata web store. Uh, depending on the year of your car and the calipers you're running, that sort of thing, we have a variety of options. And our customer service team can certainly help you with very specific recommendations for your use case. The nice thing about autocross is that it's not really very hard on brakes compared to, say, track use, because there's not that sustained high temperature. So usually you can come up with something that works well for autocross and for, uh, and for street use. Okay, so now bleeding. There's, there's sort of two levels of a brake bleed, which is, the effect, which is effectively changing out your fluid. You can do a full flush, which means effectively you're going to change out all the fluid in the system and get all new fluid through everything. And there's just a quick bleed, which is mostly just addressing what's in the calipers. Um, for a track day sort of top up, um, doing just a caliper bleed, a, a service bleed, if you want to call it that, is a good way to go. Um, still do your full flush on a regular basis, but that gets rid of the most heavily abused um, fluid that's in the caliper itself and changes out with fresh fluid just from further upstream. So it's not really fresh fluid, um, but it's fluid that has not been living in a caliper for the last 20 minutes, hour, whatever. Um, you want to do that full flush once a year. I re strongly recommend you completely replace all the brake fluid in your system once a year. Again, this is not something you want to do, or not necessarily something you'll hear from a mechanic who's telling you how to keep your 20-year-old Hyundai on the road, um, but we are a Miata Performance Shop, so we are going to give Miata Performance Shop recommendations. Uh, and that is especially true if you're running a DOT4, and especially one of the exotic DOT4s that has the very high boiling temperature. Now, I haven't mentioned this yet, but there is that missing hole in the middle here, and that's DOT5. Those of you who are good at mathematics probably know this, we did skip five. Um, DOT5 has a very, very high um, temperature range. It's in the 500 degree, but it's made of a very different composition. It's silicon-based. Uh, and the problem with that is that it compresses more than these ones do, which means basically you're never going to have a firm pedal. It's always going to be squishy. It also doesn't absorb water, which is why it's great for military vehicles that sit in storage for a long time or for museum-grade classics that sit all the time. Um, since Miatas are neither one of those, we don't recommend it. Uh, you're always going to have a long, soft pedal. It's also completely incompatible with the others. So if you want to run, one of, if you want to run the silicone fluid, you effectively have to flush out completely and clean the system before you put one of these in. So not recommended. Stay away from the DOT5. It's really not for our use. Um, 5.1 is effectively a super DOT4 is the best way to look at that. So bleeding. This is an important, or fleeting or flushing, it's the same thing. Um, the technique for that, there's a bunch of different tools on the market trying to make it easier. The best way to do it is still the classic manual pump and hold method. Um, the reason for that is because all of the power bleeders that you can find, for example, have a tendency to they, they put pressure on the fluid to push it through the system. Um, cheap ones will actually put air pressure right on top of the fluid, which effectively can force air into that fluid, um, which is exactly what you're trying to get rid of in many cases. So it can introduce micro bubbles that can lead to a soft pedal. Uh, it can also help force a little bit extra fluid in the, or moisture into that fluid. So you're sort of starting towards that 3.7% wet boiling point right from the start. Even the better professional grade systems, they still have downsides such as that high pressure. So it's really not the best way to go. If you're working flat rate and you're servicing 20 year old Hyundai's all the time, by all means, go for it. If you're trying to make sure that your track Miata has the best brakes it can, you really can't bleed the ho or beat the whole friend sitting in the driver's seat, press and hold, press and hold. Um, there's another technique called a gravity bleed where you basically just open up the bleed screws and let it dribble. And that's actually what I use <laughs> because you can do it by yourself. And I've never been able to get, beat the pedal feel you can get with that. And uh, I, I started using that because I have an old Land Rover and their brake lines are crazily convoluted. And the only way to bleed an old Land Rover is a gravity bleed. So basically just open up the, the bleeders, let them dribble, and then turn them off when you, when you think you're done. It's surprisingly effective. Um, okay. 
I'm just going to look at some of the questions you guys put in here. Uh, speed, there's a question here about speed bleeders. We did another whole video on speed bleeders, how they work. They work just fine. They basically just take the work out of opening and closing the valve. Um, nothing wrong with, with speed bleeders. Uh, a, lots of questions about ABS. Now, ABS, there's a lot of violent, when ABS is actually being actuated, there's a lot of violent pumping effectively going on inside that ABS module. So you want something that doesn't foam, which is another problem with that silicone-based DOT5. Um, and it can be a problem with the super high viscosity fluids, although generally speaking, you don't quite get high enough for it to be a problem. Um, but the biggest problem is there's a lot of plumbing inside a ABS block, and so you've got to be able to flush that out as best you can. And really the best way to do it is to just keep pumping more and more fluid through until you see the stuff at the calipers um, coming out clear. On some of the newer Miatas, I'm, I must admit I'm not as... Uh, not as familiar with this. I haven't looked up this on the NCs and the NDs, but I know that partway through the NB production, um, they actually added a way to trigger the ABS unit using the diagnostic connector. So when you're bleeding the brakes, you could you know, use a little wire jumper and run the AB, cycle the ABS pump, and that would help flush some any, any fluid that was in your little backwaters out for you. Um, a way to get around that on a car that doesn't have that capability is effectively get out on the road and trigger the ABS put two wheels off, the, off on the shoulder, nail the brakes, get the ABS shaking the wheel for you, and that will move some fluid through there, and then you can do a secondary bleed if, you're, if your pedal is getting a little bit softer. ABS does make it a little bit harder to bleed the brakes, but that's, that's sort of the easy way to do it. It doesn't mean two stops, but you can get it done. Um, so one question is, so turbo Miatas use a brake fluid with a higher boiling point. The amount of heat you put into your brakes is proportional to the weight of the car and proportional to the square of the speed that you're using. So the faster your car is, the harder you're working your brakes and the more heat you're putting into your brake fluid. So basically, yes, um, faster cars, whether it's a V8, whether it's a turbo, um, or extremely lightweight cars that have the ability to accelerate quickly, they are gonna put a heavier load on their brakes and therefore more heat into their brake fluid than lighter, low-powered cars are going to, especially the lower power, the um, ones that aren't going as quickly. So. Basically, the harder you work your brakes, the more you should be making sure that you've got good, fresh, high-rated brake fluid in the system. We have a question there, Travis. Yes. What fluid offers the most firm feel for street use? Okay, the question is, what fluid offers the most firm feel for street use? It's unlikely there's going to be a significant difference. Um, obviously, again, we've talked about the DOT5, silicone-based stuff. Stay away from that. That's just a given. Um, there shouldn't be a significant difference in feel on any one, any DOT3, DOT4 that I've come across. Uh, the quality of the bleed has a bigger effect that I've, that I've come across in terms of not using a power bleeder, um, doing a, an old school manual bleed, and also making sure that it's fresh. Because as the fluid ages and it starts to absorb water, it is going to start feeling a little spongier. Um, so the best thing you can do for good quality, break, a good solid brake feel is fresh fluid, well bled, and also serviced brakes because almost all Miatas have sliding piston or sliding calipers, and they have little pins that the, that the caliper body moves in and out on, and those corrode over time. So if you, if you pop the, the, um, the piston part of the caliper off and just put some silicone-based uh, brake lubricant on there, there's one called Sil Glide that is sold, I think it's a Permatex product, we get it through Napa, um, does a great job of lubricating those slider pins. That has a big effect on the feel of your brakes, and will also help your brakes work better and your pads wear more evenly. If you if you look at your brake pads and you find out that they're much more worn on one side than the other, that's a sign of a sticking uh, slider pin. Any more questions there, Travis? You covered the rest of them. Okay, that was fairly easy. Um, I'm just looking to see what questions on here we have in here. Uh, one question is, how does it taste? Um, there are poison control uh, comments on the back of these things. I wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty bitter, actually. So, don't. Yeah. Um... Is it fine to run DOT4 in a car that recommends DOT3? Now, this is a, this is a question with a couple of different answers to it. Um, for Miatas, yes. You can go ahead and you can run DOT4 in a car that originally specified DOT3. On some older cars, because there are a couple of different chemicals, or extra additives to the DOT4 stuff, it can affect the seals. So old British cars, like my old Land Rover, for example, if you run a more aggressive brake fluid or a brake fluid with the... With the right formulation in it, it will start to attack the natural rubber seals in the system, and you're going to have failing wheel cylinders and that kind of thing. 
Less of an issue by the time we get to modern cars, and even though the 30 years old 1990 Miatas are still considered modern cars in this regard, um, but it is a good option. Uh, there is a brake fluid from Castrol called uh, LMA, Low Moisture Absorption. I think it actually stands for something else, but um, they now give it a different name. It's now called Advanced Performance, um, but it, is, it actually is compatible with those older, older systems um, from my understanding. But Generally speaking, yes. If you can run DOT3 in it, you can run DOT4 in it, and you can run DOT5.1 in it. But again, stay away from that silicon-based DOT5. Um, one thing you will find, and this is the way that life goes, is that the higher the temperature rating, the more it's going to cost. That's just the nature of the beast. You'll notice that these cans get smaller and smaller <laughs> as you go higher in the, in, the, uh, in the range, and that's simply because it does become more expensive, but also because... I should have mentioned this at the beginning. This stuff absorbs water from the air. These cans are all sealed. If you open this up, you're going to see there's going to be a little pull tab in here, or they might have a, a foil seal on them. Um, once they have been opened, they will start to absorb moisture from the air, and that basically means that your fluid is going bad. As soon as you open them, you should use them. This is, this is the exception to the rule I have right here. This is one I just I grabbed out of my, my uh, box, my Cadillac stuff. This was clear as water when I opened it. And now it kind of looks like apple juice, which tells me it's been, even in our desert environment, um, it has been absorbing um, fluid from the air. So this is mostly just useful as a prop for a YouTube video at this point. So that's another reason to use small cans is because you're going to have to, if you don't use it all in that one setting, you're done with it. It's finished no matter what. And that's why you see them actually in steel cans like this, because the steel can keeps it from absorbing moisture through the air longer than a plastic can. So if possible, get one with a, uh, with a metal can. It actually has a longer shelf life. Um, luckily, this is the stuff that Flying Miata sells. Uh, and if you are a particular breed of nerd that loves reading all sorts of very technical stuff about brakes, StopTech has a series of very good white papers by uh, James Walker Jr. on their website. Um, excellent stuff on how to bed brakes, how to bleed brakes, um, the technology of brake fluid. There's some really, really good information there. I highly recommend uh, going, digging around the site and, um, and reading them. There's, Good, good stuff there. Any more questions, Travis? Okay, well, I think uh, one last thing I'm going to cover is the proper order for bleeding calipers. Um, basically, you want to go from the caliper that is, your, your goal is to change out all the fluid in the system. If your goal is to change all the fluid in the system, you want to start with the caliper that is furthest from the master cylinder. And not furthest in terms of the car's layout, but if you follow the actual brake lines around, which is the one that's furthest away? So, for example, on an NA or NB Miata, it actually turns out that that one is the driver's side rear because of where the brake lines run, um, I think. I always look at it upside down. So. <laughs> so the driver's side rear, and then you go the passenger side rear, and then you go the passenger side front, and then the driver's side rear. Luckily, that's a nice little walk around the car. If you don't do it in that order, it's not the end of the world. It might just take you a little bit longer to get the flush done. Now, depending on how the brake lines are run through the car, that order may be a little bit different. I can tell you on a 1966 left-hand drive Land Rover, the one that is furthest from the master cylinder is actually the driver's front, the one directly underneath the master cylinder because it's got brake lines that go all over the place on a very short wheelbase. But generally speaking, if you can, you go for the one that is the furthest according to the brake lines from the, uh, from the master cylinder. Again, it's not critical. If you do it in the wrong order, you don't have to stop and go over. It's just going to take you a little bit longer to get it all done. Um, I think that's basically it. So if you have any questions, please do put them in the comments. We will do our best to answer them. Um, but it all comes down to fresh fluid is better than awesome fluid. And uh, awesome fluid that is fresh is the best of all. And of course, you can get awesome fluid from Fly Miata. Uh, my name is Keith Tanner. If, you have any, um, if you've enjoyed this, please like, comment, subscribe, all the usual social media things. We'll see you again soon with some more content. And I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much.